No success in the world can compensate for failure in the home. That's why Club Wealth was founded, to help driven, successful, and busy real estate agents like you double their business while building a strong, balanced home life. Join us each week as high-producing agents and team leaders share their stories and unpack the principles and systems they've used to double, triple, and even quadruple their business while enjoying greater quality of life. And now, here's the latest episode of Club Wealth TV. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. We have a very special episode because we are sharing a conversation in which Michael was interviewed on another industry podcast. So we're going to jump to that in just a second. First, want to just thank everyone for sharing the show. We so appreciate all the great feedback in, that we get both in the Facebook group for the live broadcasts and on Apple Podcasts for the reviews and ratings. We really appreciate everyone that takes their time to leave a rating, to give a shout out to one of our amazing guests in their rating and their review so that other people know uh, and get a sense of what the show is like and what to expect and who the guests are. We appreciate everyone that shares it with another agent or another colleague in the business. And with that being said, let's jump into this very special episode. Uh, excited today to help expand your thinking like never before. I have with me Michael Hellickson, who is a top 1% agent in the country. Um, at one time was selling between 120 to 180 transactions a month, <laughs> over 700 listings at any given time. You might be asking yourself, how in the world is that even possible? We're going to get into that. Whether or not that's your aspiration or not, I would venture to say that most people are like, yeah, that's, that's a little beyond what I'd like to do. Nevertheless, hearing what Michael has done is going to help you get to that next tier that you want to be at. He's also the founder of Club Wealth, um, which is a coaching company that has a really interesting philosophy. I'm excited to welcome today on the show and uh, brace yourself to think bigger like never before. Michael Hillickson, thank you for being here, my friend. I appreciate you having me on. It's great. It's an honor to be here. So. Yeah, it's, it's my pleasure to have you here. As you, um, obviously, those that are tuning in know that, again, this is the Think Bigger Real Estate Show. And I don't know, um, other than maybe Grant Cardone, who kind of expanded all of our thinking um, some time back, uh, your story is pretty impressive, my friend. Um, first of all, let's get into how in the world do you do that kind of volume um, with a very... A, a, relatively small team. Can you just kind of get like cue us into that a little bit, just so that yeah. the curiosity is, is at least uh, kind of uh, satiated a little bit? Well, it's, it didn't happen overnight, obviously. And it's, it happens a lot faster for our clients now than it did for me back when I was starting. Uh, you know, it took me about 10 years to even get to the four or 500 transaction a year mark. Uh, and then from there, it took me, you know, one, we, we kind of stagnated in about the four or 500 transactions a year mark until about 2007, uh, and in 2007, when the market crashed, you know, I'm a real believer that where there's chaos, there's opportunity, right? And so we started to see this, we started to see, uh, and we were doing a ton of everything, right? Retail, short sales, whatever. And we didn't do a lot of short sales prior to 2007. We, I shouldn't say that we did short sales. We just didn't, there wasn't a lot of volume, um, but we were doing a ton of retail and, uh, all of a sudden the market crashed and, you know, the, the money shut off and we're looking around and we're thinking, Hey, there's going to be opportunity here. Uh, and so we just embraced short sales. We embraced REO heavy. Uh, and we went almost immediately from, you know, that four or 500 transactions a year mark to well over a thousand transactions a year. We we're doing 120 to 180 a month, um, with just 16 agents. I mean, we were at the time we were the number one team in the country. Um, but we only had 16 agents on the team. And, and that's the key. And not only that, and, and then part of it's it, people, a lot of times people are watching us and, and, when they hear me talk about this, they think, oh, well, I don't want to be that big. And I just want to, you know, be a solo agent and stay small, keep it all, blah, blah, you know, that kind of thing. And they, their perception a lot of times is that it's harder to run a team or that you have to spend more time when you're running a team. Uh, the reality is it's easier. I mean, when I was at that level, I, with, with our real estate business, I was only working 12 days a month. And it was, and the, the time that I was putting in during my days, my, my running the team time was really about eight hours a week. Uh, the rest of it was personal production because I enjoyed going on listing appointments and stuff like that. So I was, I was still going on listing appointments, taking, I kid you not, 50 to 75 listings a month, not counting the team, not counting REO. That's just me going on mom and pop appointments. I'd go on six to eight appointments a day. Uh, I'd do that four days a week, three weeks a month. That was my 12 days uh, per month. And, um, and I would make 115 to 125 follow-up calls in the car in between appointments. And, um, that's how I did it. 
and it was pretty, it was pretty straightforward. <laughs> you must have had a pretty impressive operations team behind the scenes that were and 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 maybe somebody running the company or was that you? I mean, with that kind of um, that size of a ship, right? Yeah. Um, you can't just be going on listing appointments and not have anybody at the helm <clears throat> steering things and navigating strategy and keeping you know HR department and keeping people happy and all of that. I mean, that's that's a that's a big operation. It is. It, you know, we had 44 people on the team, but again, only 16 of those were agents. The rest were administrative. And, and I'll tell you, it's a lot more profitable to build an administrative heavy team than it is to build an agent uh, heavy team because you got to pay the agents a lot more. And frankly, uh, the administrative team is much better at making sure balls aren't getting dropped, right? They're, they're, they're much more task oriented, check the box, make sure all the boxes are checked. And, uh, and so we, seg- we, we believe in a segmented workflow. Uh, so for example, if I'm a, I mean, I'm either a listing agent or I'm a buyer agent, right? I'm not both. Uh, now there are teams that we coach that ha- that do both. We, we coach people all the way from solo agents on the biggest teams in the country. And while there's a lot of similarities, particularly amongst the higher producers, uh, they all do things a little bit differently. Right. And so for me personally, I'm a real believer in a segmented workflow where, if I'm going to be a listing agent, by golly, that's what I do. And I'm just going to be the very best listing agent on the planet. If I'm going to be a buyer agent, well, by golly, I'm going to be the very best buyer agent on the planet. And I can get really good at that. Same thing with the administrative team. I had listing coordinators. I had, the, I had marketing coordinators. I had transaction coordinators, uh, short sale negotiators. I mean, you name it. But we segmented that workflow down so that people were able to get extremely good at the thing that they do. Um, and it works. Now, when you talk about leadership, no, I, I didn't have somebody else running the company. I ran the company uh, during that time and did all of those. You know, I, wore, I wore I wore the leadership hat as well as you know going out and being the lead listing agent for the team as well. And we had four other listing agents usually uh, between four and five. But my administrative team, I did have a lead administrator uh, that really focused on, and she was also a transaction coordinator. Um, so uh, she was both doing the work and leading. So I'm not a, I'm not a believer that you should have leaders that all they do is lead, right? The best way to lead is by example. Uh, and so I, I really believe that it's, it's like today, the way we've got our company set up today. All of the leaders on our team today are in production. And, uh, and they work hard, uh, doing the things that the people that they lead also do. Uh, and, and if you want respect from your team, if you, if you expect them to respect and follow what you're doing, then you better be doing what you're asking them to do. Don't be afraid of it. Lead from the front, not the back. Absolutely. Um, you know, what a great leadership principle. I know we're going to get into the topic that a lot of people, um, know you by, which is, uh, your, uh, um, affinity for, and I don't know if that's even the right term, but your expertise in the area of, of short sales and really helping people at least be astute to watching the market and reading the world um, as to if how big this market shift is, right? With 14% unemployment, what can we expect? Um, I want to get into that a little bit because I know that that's, again, part of the reason why um, people are tuning in today and kind of how this has been advertised is that you're a guy that can really um, that capitalize big time um, last time this came about, you know, I think this, this recession that we're in, I guess we could probably officially call it that, yeah. um, is different, right? It's not housing related lead. Um, but what's your take? Like what's, what type of short sale opportunity is going to come from all of this? Well, there's already short sales happening right now. I mean, anybody that bought their house in the last couple of years, you know, the, the, they don't have 10% equity in their house and the cost of selling, you know, you figure it's going to be somewhere between eight and 10% cost of selling. So if, if I bought my house in the last couple of years and all of a sudden I lost my job and I can't make my payments, uh, you know, there's a real possibility I may be a short sale or there could be a number of other circumstances that would cause me to need to do a short sale. There could be all kinds of reasons why a short sale might be necessary. Uh, and yes, I think we're going to see more short sales come up. Do I think that it's going to be like 2008 and two, you know, two, or really 2007 and 2011? No, I don't see that happening. Uh, first of all, there's, I'm not chicken little. I'm not the. I'm, I'm not subscribing to the belief of, a, of that a lot of people do that. You know this this the marketplace is about to fall apart and we're all gonna you know it's all gonna go to heck in a handbasket. Um, th- there's different factors impacting things today. And here's the reality: Americans are resilient. They want to get back to work, right? So the only reason they're out of work it's not because there's not work to be had. It's because the government's not letting them go back to work. 
And so, uh, you know, I think that you're going to see as much as the unemployment numbers are crazy right now, as soon as we stop paying people more money to be on employment than we do to actually go do their jobs, guess what? They'll be back to work. Um, so it, do I think everybody's going to be back to work? No, certainly there's businesses that will go under as a result of this. There's people that will be out of work long-term because of this. Um, but do I think that there will be short sale opportunities and REO opportunities again? Yes, absolutely. We're gearing up for it. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm right now rewriting. I'm actually today, in fact, recording a bunch of the videos for, uh, our short sale and REO course. Um, so I wouldn't be spending that kind of time on it if I didn't think that something was coming. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. so if you're an agent, obviously Portland isn't too far away from the Seattle market where you're at, right? Bonnie Lake. Um, yeah. So, um, what would you expect? Again, part of my audience is here. Part of it's around the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, if one were to say, okay, let's read the market. Let's, let's be prepared for this. Like other than even maybe the course, which I'd, I'd love to have our audience get their hands on, right? At least know how to get their hands on it. Um, what would you say would be a way that they could best prepare to take advantage of a, of a, of a short sell market that may be uh, pending, you know, or coming at us very quickly. Uh, so first of all, short sale opportunities come to us by and large, and there's multiple different, there's, there's actually several ways that are short sale specific that we can get leads, but, but the majority of short sale leads come to us the same way that every other lead come to us. It's just a seller lead that we realize at some point, and usually it's on the listing appointment, not on the phone, but at some point in time, we figure out that, oh, this is going to be a short sale. And you just have to change uh, you know, what, how you handle that appointment at that point to make sure that you're covering the short sale aspects of it. So it's not like, oh, I'm going to go target short sales. Although you can, uh, and there's great ways to target um, those distressed properties. Um, but I, I wouldn't, I, I, w- I would start with you. The question was, you know, how would you start to prepare yourself for this? The first thing I would do uh, is I would dial in my habits, right? So first you got to learn what you got to do, right? So I get educated, then I would dial in my habits uh, because that's really going to be key, right? What I want to know is that every single day I, I'm doing three things, lead generation, lead follow-up and lead conversion. Those are the three most important things every business owner, particularly in real estate, uh, but even you, Justin, in, in title, every per- person who's in business today, those are the three things they have to do every single day. And they have to become habitual. So you've got to, if I'm preparing for this, I'm getting aggressively into my schedule and my habits and making sure that everything I can, every, everything I do every day, 90% of that is going to be leading directly to a listing or a sale. And if it's not that kind of activity, I'm delegating it, I'm automating it, I'm getting rid of it somehow, but I need, I need 90% of my day to be on those three things. Say the three again, lead generation, Lead generation, lead follow up, and lead conversion. Lead conversion. Yep. Ninety percent of your day. That's interesting. Ninety percent of your day. So let's say in a t- typical um, eight-hour work day, right? Ninety percent of that's probably close to like seven hours a day, right? At least seven of those eight hours a day are on those three activities. Yeah. Think about this. When I was at my peak, right? I would I was working four days a week, uh, so I'd work twelve days a month, uh, and I was doing seven thirty in the morning till ten thirty at night. My day looked like this. I would spend a half hour in my daily huddle every morning. So 7.30 in the morning was my daily huddle. After that, I'd, I'd leave on appointments. And then once a week, I would have my team meeting. And once a week, I would have my team call night. And then, uh, and so there's a couple hours there. And then once a month, I would have, I'm sorry, once a quarter, I would have a client event. Once a quarter, I would have a team activity where we'd go do something fun as a team. Then once a quarter, I'd spend a half hour with each team member, just one-on-one. That was really pretty much my, you know, and, and, you know, maybe another hour a week uh, of just miscellaneous stuff. That was really what it took to run the number one team in the country. The problem is right now that so many agents are so anxious to get out of production, right? Because, oh, I'm too good for production. I've, I'm, I've grown my team at the point now that I don't, I don't need to actually go out and sell houses. I can just focus on running my team. And, blah. and it's an ego thing for most, not all, uh, but for most, it becomes an ego thing. And, and at the end of the day, if we can get our egos out of it, if we can understand that, look, if I'm going to be that guy, if I'm going to be out of production, my new lead generation is now recruiting. So I need to treat recruiting just like I treated lead generation when I was, when I was selling. Um, so if, if we can make that shift, the actual leadership part of it is very small. It doesn't take a long time to lead your team. You just have to do it well during the time that you have. You're right. I would, I would um, maybe reposition that again for my own mind, right? Is that, the leadership thing is the, your entire day, but most of it's leadership by example, right? Yes. 
that, yes. that um, people know what to do, not because you're telling them what to do, but because you're showing them what to do, right? Show me, don't tell me. Well, um, it's a powerful principle, right? For all of us, regardless of what industry you're in, as you move into a leadership role, that doesn't mean that you sit back like, you know, sometimes you'll see government workers. And again, I'm sure this is a broad stereotype and it's probably not very fair, but they get the, you know, like the reputation of, of lots of people uh, lots of layers of management, lots of people watching other people do the work, and it te- and it happens in the you know in the in the private sector as well, um, but typically not to sustainable long term companies, right? The best companies out there, the leaders, like you think of like Steve Jobs and and how Apple was built, like he was he didn't just sit at the top and do press conferences, like he was actively involved in the technology day in and day out, working as hard as anybody. That's right. Um, so you know, doesn't mean necessarily that you need to have the same culture that. Steve promoted right around himself, right? You can still be a little more kind to the people around you if you study much about Steve, but his impact in leading by example, I think is a great one for all of us that I hear you really embracing and ad- adopting part of the reason why you've had so much success and it's been sustainable success, right? Not kind of a flash in the pan success. Now it's been over decades. And, but here, think about this. Like, why is it that, that our listing agents, like I said, I had four to five listing agents on the team at any given time. Why was it that our listing agents were averaging 10 to 15 on the low end, my, my, the, the two that had the lowest production were at 10 to 15 listings a month. And the ones that had higher production were at 15 to 21 listings a month. Why is that when most agents struggle to get three or four listings in a month? Why is it that our listing agents were so much more successful? And I'll tell you, it, it's, it's a couple of things. Number one, it's because we had our lead generation automated. We had transitioned successfully from chasing business to attracting business. And that's a big deal, right? And it's not easy to do. But by having made that transition, all of a sudden now, um, those agents had great warm leads coming in. So they were doing more lead follow-up than they were lead generation. Now, they still did you know, expireds and FISBOs and, and cold calls, and that sort of thing, because we required a certain portion of that, right? Uh, so we required a part of their day to be that, at least an hour a day, uh, but in order to qualify to get our great leads. But then we've automated that lead generation process. Then we automated as much of the lead follow-up process as we could. Uh, and then, of course, we weren't afraid to get on the phones and hit the phones hard and make those phone calls and talk to people. Uh, but guess what? Why were they willing to do that? Because I was doing it. Right. And I was doing twice as many listings as they were, more than twice as many listings as they were. In some months, I would do as many as three times as many listings as they would. Why? Because because leading by example shows them that not only is this how you do it, but I'm going to hold you to a high standard just as I hold myself to a high standard. I'm not going to hold you to as high a standard as I hold myself to, but I'm going to hold you to a much higher standard than the marketplace would hold you to. And, and your peers are going to look at you like, what you're doing is unusual. Here's an example. If you're a listing agent on my team, the requirement, not the suggestion, not the goal, not the objective, the requirement is that you set three listing appointments a day. If you don't set three listing appointments a day, go back to being a buyer agent, but you don't get to be a listing agent on my team, right? I mean, that's just, that's the requirement. And when you, when everybody knows that's the requirement and it becomes the normal and you give them the systems, tools, processes, techniques, and leads to do that and all the support they need to accomplish that. It's possible. Now, the part of the key to this is, maybe we talked about that segmented workflow. Our listing agents, when they would go out on a listing appointment, they list the house, they come back, they hand that listing off. They don't ever talk to that person again unless they need to be reclosed. That From then forward, it's administrative. The administrative team takes care of everything. So that listing agent can focus 100% on setting and going on appointments. That's all they need to do. And when you really get this at a high level, I know agents around the country today that literally their listing agents don't even set their own appointments. All they do is go on appointments all day long. That's literally their entire job is go on appointments all day long, close those appointments, hand it off. I've got somebody close to me who um, runs a sales team for a high-end window and door company. Yeah. Um, and uh, <clears throat> they have a very robust lead generation system, people out at fairs, online, every, like every way in which you can imagine. Yep. And then um, they have people who are calling and setting appointments and their salespeople, their only job is to show up at homes at designated times and close that sale. Um, talk to me a little bit about it. I, I know that there are different philosophies around real estate. I know one concern that comes up when I hear that model <clears throat> is what happens to the client experience, right? You come in and part of the reason why people say, I want to work with that realtor because you like that realtor. And then you go off and say, and that, and you never call that person again, right? 
How does that lend itself to repeat and referral? Or is that not really the emphasis? Is it, is it, you know, more of a transactional model doesn't necessarily mean that people are uh, misled or, or that they're not taken care of, but to not have that same person ever not allowed, but, you know, preferred to not talk to that person again, does that become a bait and switch? How do you get around that to where it doesn't create, we got tons of volume, but we've kind of got this, this, um, kind of mess behind us of, of people who didn't get this service experience that they thought they were going to get. I love that you're bringing this up. Let me ask you this. How many transactions does the average agent in the country do a year? The average agent, the average agent that does this full time, it's full probably time. 10. Okay. At best, right? 10 to 12. Okay. Yeah. One a month. How many of those are repeat and referral? But then by the way, I'll, I'll just give you the national association of realtors statistic. Uh, six years, seven years ago was that 61% of the average agent's business came from repeat and referral clients, sphere of influence generally. 60%? 61. 61. Okay. Uh, two years later, that number had dropped to 41%. I'm sorry, four years later, that number dropped to 41%. Wow. That's a quite the uh, drop. It is. And I don't know the number from last year, but I've heard that it's in the thirties. Um, and so here's what's happening. 92% of all purchasers begin their search online. 92%. And of those, 72% work with the first agent they come in contact with. Those are crazy numbers. So that's part, a big part of what's driving the decline in referral-based business. Now, I will say this. Yeah. When I sold real estate full-time, my, my team was doing 190-plus transactions a year, about, actually about 192, 196 transactions a year by referral. So you tell me, were we, were we delivering a world-class customer experience? You had to alert, or, yeah, people wouldn't have been coming back. Absolutely. And, and you had to have stayed in contact with those people, maybe not about the transaction, but after the fact. That's correct. Um, okay, keep going. So here's the key. Here, here's the deal. The customer experience, when you are running the right team, right? When your team is functioning as it should, the customer experience is far better on a team than it is with a solo agent. Because guess what? When I'm on appointments as a solo agent, you can't get a hold of me. But when I'm on appointments as a team leader or a listing agent on a team, you can get a hold of my team anytime, instantly right? You can get a response to your question right now. You can get whatever you need right now. Your flyers are empty. No problem. We'll have some out there in, in you know, right away. Like literally whatever's going on can be solved like that. Whereas when I'm a solo agent trying to be the jack of all trades, I'm really the master of none. I can't get it all done. Now I'm not, I'm not saying that there's not solo agents out there that deliver a great customer experience. I'm just telling you that it's ego telling. If you believe that you as a solo agent can, can, are, are the, are the best alternative and that, that nobody on a team or no team can deliver the world-class experience that you can as a solo agent, I'm telling you right now, get your ego out of the way because it ain't true. You can deliver a far better experience as a team than you can as a solo agent. And again, I know a lot of solo agents and we've got a lot of clients that are solo agents that deliver a great, a real world-class customer experience, but it gets better as you develop your team properly. And as you bring in the right people, tools, systems, technology, and support on that team, it's, you can't, well, you, I shouldn't say you can't lose, but it's, it makes it really hard to lose. You do very well. Some of the experiences that we've had in, in maybe teams that weren't built, right. That have been customers. Right. And I can speak this because on the title and escrow side, right. We deal with kind of the back end, right. The administrative side, and you've got some teams that are dialed and, and w function as you describe where there's a point of contact, there's always somebody available. There's never this delay and some, so-and-so is out of town or they're in an appointment. Like there's always someone available, right. Like you described. Uh, when teams aren't built right, <clears throat> right, <clears throat> the client and both other uh, entities like title and escrow, like lending, tend to struggle a little bit in working with 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 teams that aren't built right because there's so many hands in the pot and you're repeating information because so and so didn't pass it along. What are some of the key things if somebody here has a team and they want to build it right? Um, is there either technologies and or systems that you've put in place to make it to where the customer, once that deal is closed and the transaction moves to what you call the administrative quadrant, is there still one point of contact? Or if so, like, talk to me kind of through how that tends to be a great experience for all parties involved um, now that it's been moved to kind of that next, that next quadrant. So I'll share this and then I've got to run. I've got a, uh, I've got a uh, meeting with uh, uh, something you may know him, Ben Kinney. Uh, I've got, I don't yeah. I've got to meet with Ben here. We've got an appointment coming up, but uh, that being said, 
um, I'll tell you that systems run people and people run systems. So you have to have super tight systems and you have to have the right people running them. If you've got both the experience, the handoff, everything is smooth. The transition from, from role to role and from person to person that you're dealing with at, at that given time in the transaction can happen very smoothly. Uh, and it can provide a great experience for the clients. Kind of like when you go to the doctor, right? I don't want the doctor drawing my blood. It's going to hurt if the doctor does it. Yeah. They're going to screw it up. They're going to be searching for that vein. They're going to poke around a bunch of times before they figure it out. If the nurse does it, game over, man. She's going to take care of me. It's not going to hurt nearly as bad. It's just done and over with, right? Because she does it all day, every day. Yeah. So I moved from you know the receptionist to the nurse, to the doctor, to back to the nurse and back to the receptionist. And, I'm done. and, and that process happens smoothly because in the medical field, they've developed systems and, and, and made it a common practice and people are used to it and it's comfortable. Uh, and we need to do that as professionals in the real estate industry as well. And the more that, and, and you're seeing this across the country right now, the teams that are doing this are having ridiculous success. They're growing like crazy. Uh, they have great reviews on Zillow on everywhere. They're having these wonderful reviews. They're getting a lot of repeat and referral business and they're scaling their businesses and they're able to do it and have a life in the process. So yeah, that's the, that's the book. Okay. I know you've got to go, um, two last things really quickly. You've got a coaching program <clears throat> where, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the only people that can coach you are people that are doing twice as much business as you, right? Kind of defies what some of the coaching philosophies are out there yeah. to talk to us about, um, how people, um, learn more about that. If you wanted to have like have a coach, but you want the coach to actually be again in the game and performing at twice the level you're currently at, mm -hmm. how do people learn more about that? Uh, you can go to our website, go to clubwealth.com. Uh, you can learn all about it there. Uh, you can join our Facebook group, uh, which is just facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash club wealth. Um, well, you know, I, I don't really pitch when we, when we do this stuff, I just want to bring value to you guys. I mean, feel free to check us out. Um, and we have programs from everything from brand new agents on up to the biggest teams in the country. Um, and you know, 79 coaches, uh, that all produce at a higher level and we, and it's whether it's broker owner coaches, you know, so we have, we have a broker program where we coach broker owners and we have an agent program where we coach agents. Uh, and regardless of which program you're in, your coach always ha does more business than you do. Uh, and so it's, it's unique. It's very unique. Uh, we back it up with a guarantee. We, we make you an extra hundred thousand dollars, your first year coaching with us, or we give you your money back. So there's no risk. Uh, there's no long-term contracts. They can cancel anytime with 60 days notice. So. Uh, anyway, long story short, feel free to jump on there. You can learn about it there. Why don't we do this? Let me give your audience something. Can I do Please. that? Yep. Uh, guys, why don't you just grab your cell phones and send a text message. I want you to send the words club wealth, two words, uh, to the number I'm going to give you. And when you do, I'm going to send you 17 of our best lead sources. If you do it right now while we're on the live, I'll give you 31 of our best 109 lead sources. If you wait till after and you're just watching this recorded, uh, you'll still get the 17 uh, of our best lead sources. It's free. And a lot of the lead sources are free. You don't have to even pay for them. Um, so the number is 727-287-5993. I'll give it to you again. 787. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Back up. 727-287-5993. And text the words Club Wealth to that number, and we'll shoot you these lead sources. And, uh, you know, first, you know, get lead generation dialed in, then work on your lead follow up, then lead conversion, and get real focused on the habits. You'll, you'll be surprised at how quickly you'll grow. I love it, my friend. Okay, last question. Yeah. Uh, you're a big thinker, no doubt. You um, have, have demonstrated that. What does a guy like you do to continue to, to expand your possibilities, to continue to be a big thinker? Uh, I surround myself with big thinkers. So, I mean, that's, uh, you become the socioeconomic average of the five people you spend the most time with. So, you know, you want to increase your income, you want to be a better person, hang out with better people that make more money. And I'm not saying that better and more money are necessarily tied to one another. Um, you know, but if you want to be a jerk, hang out with jerks. You want to be a nice guy, hang out with nice people. You want to yeah. make more money, hang out with people that make more money. You know, you just, you're going to become the socioeconomic average of the five people you spend the most time with. You want to think big, hang out with big thinkers. Uh, pretty straightforward. I love it, man. Great answer. Um, one last request of you, let Ben Kinney know he made a commitment to come on the show and I'm excited to have him fulfill on that. Just, I will. I'll do say, that. The Think Bigger Real Estate Show is waiting his presence. Um, and then secondly is to the audience and that request are these three simple words and they are go think bigger. Thank you so much, Michael, for helping us do that today. I'm excited to continue to stay in touch and, and have my possibilities expanded as a result of you. I love it. You. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.